Matthew chapter 6, the first eight verses. And the word of God today reads from the King James text. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. You know the sincerest of kisses are those kisses which are given in secret. Even so, the sincerest of gifts is given in secret. The sincerest of prayers are prayed when God alone is listening. The sincerest tears are shed when no one but the Lord sees them. The sincerest acts of compassion are done without an audience. Am I telling the truth today? Yes. See, it's funny, I'll, I'll drive out to the property in the country sometimes, and every time I drive out to Oklahoma, without exception, and I'm alone, I pray. A lot of times when Tommy's with me, I pray. I at least sing, or I, <laughs> I'm at least worshiping. But often when I'm alone, I I. I dare say without exception, I tend to have prayer meetings while I'm driving up to the country. And Johnny, sometimes I'll be having me a prayer meeting and the tears are just flowing out of my eyes as I'm talking to the Lord about different people in different situations and I'm asking Him to intercede on behalf of these individuals or to intercede on behalf of our nation. And tears will flow from my eyes. And the other day I was having a prayer meeting in the car and I began to think. And I felt like God spoke to my heart and he said, you know, there's nobody around to see these tears. There's nobody around to see you praying. There's nobody around to hear you praying. For all anybody knows, Bill, I never pray. For all anybody knows, I never shed a tear. Do you follow what I'm saying? For all anybody knows. But the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, but these are the sincerest tears you can possibly cry because only I see them. These are the most sincere prayers you ever pray because only I hear them. You're not praying in church where you have an audience. You're not praying at a prayer meeting where you have others around you to hear what you're praying. No, you're by yourself alone with God, speaking to Him, and there is no other motivation even remotely possible except that you want to talk to God. 
and I tell them the truth. You see, it's funny when people do things in an environment where there's an audience, and it doesn't matter if there's a large audience or a small audience, we can do things in front of our kids and the real reason we did it, Rose, is so our kids could see us do it. You might not ever do that thing if you were by yourself, but your kid's sitting there. Homeless person walks up to you and says, Hey, buddy, can you spare a dime? And normally you just shoo them off. No, sorry, I'm broke. But oh, your kids are standing there. And all of a sudden, because your kids are there, you feel an obligation to appear more generous of spirit. And I tell the truth today. So you'll say, yeah, you know, and you pull out a dollar. Because you're wanting to look like a hero to your kids. You're not really doing that because you have a heart for that homeless person. Am I telling the truth? Well, I'll tell you something. According to our primary text today, the Lord said a lot of people do a lot of things for a lot of different reasons, and not all of the reasons are sincere. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, when you give to the poor, when you give to the needy, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. You know, it's funny, but uh, I read an article during the 2016 election that was talking about our illustrious occupant of the White House. I refuse to use the word president. I'll just say occupant of the White House. And it talked about the fact, Johnny, that he would not be invited to certain charity events. He wasn't even invited. He wasn't even on the guest list. But he'd show up. Oh, he'd be dressed to the nines. He'd be wearing his tuxedo, you know, looking like he was an invited guest. And Bill, he'd crash the party. And when the cameras were taking pictures for the newspapers of all the wealthy people who had come to this particular charity event, boy, Donald Trump made sure he had his fat ugly face right in front of that camera. He made sure he was in front of that camera. Oh, he wanted that publicity. He wanted everybody to know how charitable he was. Only problem is, according to the directors of these charities he never gave a dime he never wrote a check he was there for the publicity he was there so that he could get his picture in the paper so that he could put forth the appearance of being charitable and compassionate and giving but he never wrote a check that's what this article said and they interviewed a number of people in various charities that he had done this to when you have an audience you can do a lot of things and you're not doing them for sincere reasons you're not doing them for the right reasons I can stand here today and I can say my booby means the world to me. Tommy is the center of my universe. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't live without him. If anything happened to him, I don't know what I'd do with myself. I'd probably shrivel up and die. I could stand here today and tell you that He's my rock. He's what helps stabilize me when things get a little crazy. He helps bring me back down to reality when I get a little lost in imaginations and anxieties. I can say all these wonderful things, and you know what he's going to say to me after church? Why in the world did you say all that? Oh, what do you mean, why did I say all that? I said it because I meant it. No, but why did you really say all that? Why did you say it in church? Why did you say it in front of everybody? Have you ever been there? You know what I'm talking about? 
You say something sweet about your loved one, about your spouse, <laughs> and you say it in front of an audience, and all of a sudden when you get home, your spouse is looking at you like you've done something crazy. And they're like, well, why did you say all that? Why did you do that? And you're sitting there and you're saying, well, I did something perfectly nice. I did something wonderful. What are you standing here grilling me about why I did it? Well, because when you have an audience, there can be any number of reasons for your doing or saying things. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. I always get a kick when I'm in public. I always get a kick out of seeing couples, you know, walking through Walmart or walking down the street. And dear God, they're like a couple of Siamese twins attached at the hip, arm around each other, you know, just attached. I'm like, really? You can't walk through Walmart without being attached at the hip, really? Or you'll be on a bus or on a subway. I lived in New York City for 10 years. You'd be on the subway and there'd be people sitting there. And I mean, they're just a pecking and a kissing and a making out like they're about to die. Like somebody's <laughs> about to drag them off to the death chamber. And they're kissing to make up all the affection they're never going to get the rest of their lives. And you're wondering why. Or maybe you're out in public, Johnny, and you look at somebody. You may be looking, you may think their shirt's pretty. You may think they got pretty eyes. You may think they're a handsome person or a nice looking person, male or female. All of a sudden, their spouse or their boyfriend or their girlfriend comes over and pulls them up to them and plants a kiss on them. Uh huh. Staking your claim, marking your territory, letting everybody know, don't look at this one, this one's taken. Hello now. How sincere was that kiss? How sweet was that kiss? It wasn't very sweet. It wasn't very sincere. Because really it didn't have anything to do with you. It had to do with sending a message to the observers. It had to do with sending a message to everybody else standing around. You ever seen somebody do that? Yeah, where they use a kiss, you know, to mark their territory and to let you know this was a... Tommy cracks me up. Oh, uh, yeah, he said, uh-oh, he knows he's in for it now. He can be about as affectionate sometime. Put that down. <laughs> he can be about as affectionate sometimes as a ceiling fan. Don't get too close or you're going to get hurt. <laughs> Well, let us be in hunkies down in Oak Lawn, in the neighborhood, you know. Let us be down there, and let somebody look at this fat old preacher, and let them look at me for even one second too long. All of a sudden, Tommy can't get close enough to me. All of a sudden, he's reaching for my hand. All of a sudden, he's leaning in for a kid. I'm like, what? <laughs> I can't even get you to act like this when we're alone on the sofa at home. What in the world are you doing this for now in the middle of hunkies? Oh, it, it isn't because all of a sudden he appreciates me more than he ever appreciated me. It isn't because all of a sudden he just feels this sudden urge of romance that tears over his heart. No, it's because somebody else is looking in this direction and i got to send a message. Take it. I see Bill look, I mean Johnny looking toward Bill. I, I got a feeling. <laughs> I got a feeling that I'm not the only one who experiences this. You know what I'm talking about? But you see, the sweetest kisses, the most sincere kisses are those that are given in secret. When nobody's around to see when there can't possibly be any other motivation except an expression of the heart. That's right. You see, when there's no audience, when there's nobody else looking, then the number of motivations kind of dwindles down, and it gets to the point, Rose, where if it's just you and them, there can't be but one motivation for that. Of course, could be they're about to 
pep, you know, pop a cap in your head and they're trying to say goodbye. I don't know. But for the most part, those acts which are done in secret, those acts which are done in private, are the most sincere. Am I telling the truth? This is what Jesus was trying to convey in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, when he talked about giving alms and when he talked about prayer. He said, do these things in secret. Do these things when you have no audience, when nobody else is around. Because when you do these things in secret, that's when you're at your most sincere. That is when God knows your heart is really in it. I got some people in our church that used to beg and plead with me all the time, wanted to have prayer meetings, wanted to have prayer meetings, wanted to have prayer meetings. And boy, I was just the worst pastor in the universe. Because I didn't call prayer meetings all the time. I'm not doing my job right because the church ought to be having prayer meetings. No, I'm doing my job just fine because the church ought to be praying in private. That's right. That's right. I'm doing my job just fine because the sweetest kisses are those which are done in secret. I'm doing my job just fine because the Word of God teaches that when we pray, we ought to pray in our prayer closet. Let me tell you a little secret, and Tommy can testify to this. I don't even usually pray in front of him. Oh, well, Pastor, you shouldn't do that. You should pray in front of him so he knows you pray. Why I'm not praying to him? Why should I pray in front of him? <laughs> Same here. I don't pray in front of nobody. Because when you start praying in front of people, your motivations can change. And all of a sudden, you're not as sincere as you could have been, as you should have been, as you would have been, had you been alone. Am I telling the truth? I'm going to tell you something. I, I read a book years ago about a young lady who uh, commented on her father's prayer life and her father was one of the great reformers. I believe it was either uh, uh, John Wesley or one of those, you know, a great man of God. And she talked about how he would pray. And I read this book and I remember thinking to myself as I was reading, uh, my mind works in really strange ways. I, I look at things a whole lot different than a lot of people do. I'm not saying I'm right and you're wrong. I'm just saying it's different, okay? She said, oh, my father would pray and he would say this and he would say that. And oh, bless God. And I thought to myself and I said, well, number one, how do you know what your father said when he prayed? And number two, would he have said that if you weren't looking? Would he have prayed the same words if you were not his audience? Am I telling the truth? Oh, I'm going to tell you something. Jesus Christ came. The word of God said his name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Jesus Christ came so that we could know God, not only so that we could know God, but so that we could know Him intimately. God does not just merely want to be in relationship with you. He does not just want to have a relationship with you. He wants to have an intimate relationship with you. The problem with a lot of Christians is the only time they whisper a prayer is when they're in church. The only time they worship God is when we're having corporate worship. Oh my goodness. The only time they shed a tear is when they have an audience. This preacher, I've done things different for decades and decades and decades. One of the things that I do differently than most churches in the Pentecostal movement, growing up as a kid, Johnny, 
I grew up with, you know, we'd have a church service, and at the end of the church service, the pastor would say, if you need prayer, if you're sick in body, if you need the Lord to touch you, if you're going through a trial, if you're going through a struggle, if you're having a hard time, come on down to the front of the church, and we'll anoint you with oil, and we'll pray for you. That's the way I grew up. That's what I'm accustomed to seeing. But see, I read the Bible, and I have a terrible habit of taking the Word of God very literally, very seriously. I believe that God said in a certain way, He meant it a certain way for a reason. And in the book of James chapter 5, it said, Is there any sick among you? Let him respond to an altar call and go down and get prayed for. No, that's not what it says. It says, Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them anoint him with oil and pray. That's what it says, Johnny. It doesn't say let him respond to an altar call. It says let him call. Let him make the first move. Let the sick person initialize the act of prayer by asking for prayer. Well, I've been pastoring now over 35 years. I've believed this <laughs> since my first church. I never called people to the altar and asked them to, if they wanted to be prayed for, come on down. I've never done that. I let people know, if you have a need, if you have something you need prayed for, if you have something that you want uh, to be anointed with oil for, you need to ask. Why, preacher, so you can feel all superior and you can feel... No, 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 no. Because God put it in that context and in that order for a reason. When the sick asks for prayer, they're exercising faith. Did you hear what I said? When the sick asks for prayer, they're exercising faith. Mm -hmm. Well, if I go down when the preacher has an altar call, aren't I exercising faith? Um, no. You see, when you do things in an environment where there's an audience, you can do it for all kinds of reasons. Well, Sister Johnson's got cancer. Everybody in the church knows I've got cancer. If I don't go down when the preacher asks us to come down and be prayed for, I'm going to look like I don't have any faith. So why is she really going down there? Because she don't want to look like she had not got any faith. Guess what? She don't. That's why she goes down, gets prayed for, goes home and dies. <laughs> this is why in the Pentecostal movement for many decades, I've seen people get prayed for, and then I've seen them continue to be sick. I've seen them continue to die. I've seen them continue to struggle. He had been down to the altar a hundred times to be prayed for. Why? They've never done it in God's order. They've never done it the way God ordained that it should be done. Hello now. They never first exercised faith. When I was pastoring my first church, my grandmother knew how I was. She knew that I would never offer prayer. That's something Pentecostal preacher, you got to understand. That's not the way Pentecostal preachers operate. Bless God. If you're a spiritual man of God, you offer to pray all the time. No, I don't. No, I don't. I'll let you know I believe in the power of prayer. I'll let you know I'll be praying for you. But if you want me to lay hands on you and pray for you, you better ask. Because I'm not going to offer I went into my grandmother Belle's house one time, and Grandma Belle, had, her whole side of her face was swollen up. I mean, she was a heavy set lady, but the whole side of her face was really swollen up bad. And she told me, she said, CJ, I went to the doctor today. I've got an inner ear infection and all this. She said, man, it hurts so bad. You don't know how bad my head hurts. She said, my whole side of my face is swollen. The doctor said I'm going to have to be out of work for at least a week to ten days or something around there. I said, really? Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's terrible. I 
After a few minutes, Grandma Bell come over to me. She said, do you have your oil on you? Do you have your anointing oil? <coughs> I said, yes, ma'am, I do. She said, would you anoint me with oil and pray? I said, yep, just waiting for you to ask. <coughs> Anointed her with oil, laid hands on her, prayed like the Word of God said, pray in the prayer of faith, the Word of the Lord said, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise them up. <coughs> Anointed her with oil, prayed for her, went out to the uh, enclosed front porch that my grandfather had and out on the front porch he had a little a wood burning stove and he used to stoke that stove man and that front porch would be warm you know it'd be awful warm and he'd go out there and sit and do his crossword puzzles and read his magazines and look through his catalogs on the front porch and I went out there and I sat down with him and after a few minutes, Grandma Bell came out and she was carrying a tray with some tea, hot tea on it. And she set the hot tea down on the table in front of us, in front of my grandfather and I. And all of a sudden she went, oh! Let out with a hoop and her right arm come flying up and she put her hand on the side of her head. My grandfather looked at her and said, what in the world? I'm going to be nice because Grandpa had some flowery language sometimes. <laughs> so we'll just say, he said, what in the world? I got you. <laughs> and Grandma Bell said, oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. I said, what, what, what? She said, as I was putting the tea down on the table, I heard what sounded like three loud claps in my ear. She said, the pain's gone. It doesn't hurt anymore. Oh, hallelujah, the pain's gone. It doesn't hurt anymore. Within about 20 minutes, the swelling had gone down. Her face had returned to normal. The pain was gone and she went back to work the next day. God had touched her. But you see, I believe it's imperative that we do things the way God said to do it. If we follow God's prescribed way of doing things, I believe we'll get the right results. But when you try to do things different than the way God's prescribed it, you don't get the same results. See, one of the things about Pentecost that I love, about the Pentecostal message. Now, I know there's a lot of Pentecostal preachers. They act like you can't get anything unless you're in church to get it. But one of the things about Pentecostal faith that I love, the way I understand it anyway, you don't need to be in church to get nothing from God. You don't need to be in church to get nothing. You want the Holy Ghost? You can get the Holy Ghost at home. You want the Holy Ghost? You can get the Holy Ghost working at a machine at your job. I had an uncle that that happened to. He was asking God to fill him with the Holy Ghost. He'd been praying for a few weeks, you know. And one day he was at work, and he used to have to wear earphone, uh, earplugs, you know, because the machines were loud. This is in a factory up in Connecticut. He said he was standing at his machine, and... Because he had the earplugs in, it was kind of quiet for him, you know. And he'd be praying because nobody else could talk to you. You know, you weren't distracted by anything. He said, I was praying and I said, Lord, I want you to fill me with the Holy Ghost. I want the Holy Ghost baptism, blah, blah, blah. And he said, all of a sudden, he said, right there at the machine, Bill, he began to talk with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave him the utterance. He received the baptism of the Holy Ghost right there at a machine in a factory. See, the way I understand this thing, the way I understand it to work, I don't have to create an environment in church where everything's all worked up and everything's in a frenzy and everything's all, you know, get people all emotional and get them all hyped up for them to get the Holy Ghost, for them to get their healing, for them to be delivered from their addiction or their trouble. No, the way I understand this thing to work, if I can teach you right, 
I will help you to come into an intimate walk with God. And it is in that intimacy where your miracle lies. It's in that intimacy where the Holy Ghost baptism lies. It's in that intimacy where your healing lies. It's in that intimacy where the deliverance that you need from drug addiction, alcohol addiction, sexual addiction, food addiction, whatever your issue, it's in that intimacy where you can find what you need and find what ails you. That's the way I understand it to work. I love when people leave a church that I'm pastoring only to come back a few days later and tell me, I received the Holy Ghost at home. I've had that happen a number of times. It's always thrilling because the person that left the church one day and the person that came back after they received the Holy Ghost weren't the same person. I had one lady come to church for a few weeks, and I mean to tell you, she had so many devils in her head, she didn't know what to do. All she could do, literally, I'm not exaggerating, I'm not teasing, I'm not joking. All she could do, brother, was look down at the floor like this. And she always had this look, blank look on her face. And a man in our church invited her to come. Her name was Margaret. And I'd say, well, hello, Margaret, how are you today? And she'd say, I'm fine, thank you, how are you? She never raised her voice above a whisper. She was constant. This woman just looked like a zombie. She literally looked and acted like a zombie. Finally, one Tuesday night, she came for Bible study. We had a snowstorm. The man in our church that normally brought her didn't even bring her. She came by herself. She drove herself. There was, I think, two other women from the church that came, that came together. They drove through the snow to come to church. There were just the four of us or so in the church. And Margaret asked me, said, Pastor, you're always talking about being born again and, and how people can be born again and all. She said, could you just explain to me exactly how that works? So I begin to tell her. I begin to talk to her. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I said, would you like us to pray with you? I've never led anybody in the fictitious sinner's prayer because you'll never read in the Bible one word about a sinner's prayer. Nowhere in the Bible do you ever see the word sinner's prayer. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell us that's how someone is saved, by praying a sinner's prayer. The Bible don't say that. i got news for you. Go look it up. I'm not the least bit worried you're going to come prove me wrong. I've been studying this book a lot of years, honey, and I guarantee you there ain't no way in the world you're going to prove me wrong. The Bible doesn't say that. I said, would you like us to pray with you? She said, what should I pray? I said, you pray whatever you want to pray. I said, all you have to do is ask the Lord to forgive you and to help lead you into a relationship with Him. That's all He wants you to do is to ask Him to help lead you into a relationship with Him. I said, He'll take it from there. So we prayed with her. I don't know what she prayed. I don't know what words she said. I didn't ask her to repeat after me. We left the church that day. Thursday night, we had an evangelistic service every week. Thursday night, Margaret showed up for church, and I kid you not, I'm not joking, one iota. She was literally just about walking on the tiptoes of her feet, on the balls of her feet. She would just, she walked in, hi, 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 she's saying hello to everybody, and she's smiling, and everybody in the church is looking like, who in the world is that? Who took over Margaret's body? That isn't the Margaret we've known for the last few weeks. Come time for testimonies. <clears throat> Margaret got up and said, I've never done this before, so I hope y'all will bear with me. And we're all looking like, what in the world's going on? Who is this woman? I don't recognize her. She said, I hope you'll bear with me. I said, Tuesday night I was here. I asked the pastor about 
what it means to be born again. He explained it to me. They prayed with me. I went home and I began to pray by myself. The sweetest kisses. The most sincere kisses are those that are when there's no audience, when nobody else is around. She said, I begin to pray by myself. She said, all of a sudden this word, I remembered the pastor preaching one time about how important it was to renounce the hidden works of darkness. She said, I had a lot of things that I've dabbled in in my life. There are a lot of things that I've done in my life that bordered on wicked and evil and bad. She said, all of a sudden, she said, in my mind, I just felt like God was saying to me, you need to renounce some things. So she said, well, I didn't know exactly what to do, but I began to say witchcraft, because she had dabbled in witchcraft. She had operated in witchcraft. She said, witchcraft, I renounce you in Jesus' name. Satanism. Oh, I didn't know she'd been involved in Satanism. God knew. She said, Satanism, I renounce you in Jesus' name. Transcendental meditation, I had no idea she'd ever been involved in transcendental. She said, Transcendental meditation, I renounce you in Jesus' name. She said, I begin to renounce these things that I believe to be contrary to God. She said, all of a sudden, as I was renouncing these things, she said, I found I was no longer speaking English. All of a sudden, I was speaking in another language that I never learned, I never knew. God filled her with the Holy Ghost in a secret place of prayer. <laughs> Wasn't in a church service, Tommy, where I was up there trying to preach everybody into a frenzy. Trying to get everybody emotionally worked up. See, I'm going to tell you, that's how a lot of Pentecostal, I hate to admit it, but that's how a lot of Pentecostal churches work, folks. Mm -hmm. No. I help Margaret understand that the sweetest kisses are those which are given in secret. Amen. The most sincere prayer you'll ever pray is praying when nobody else is around to hear but God. The most sincere worship that you'll ever give God is when nobody else is around to hear you worship Him. We got Christians in the church today. We got people in the church. Now some of y'all are going to feel like I'm hopping on your toes. If we wind up losing what few people we got over this, I'm done. I'm over it. I'm moving to Florida because I can't take it anymore. We got people in the church today. The only time they pray is when they're in church. The only time they worship is when they're in church. My goodness. Do you ever listen to gospel music while you're in your car? And just worship the Lord while you're in your car? No, I do that in church. That's what church is for. No. See, that's where you're wrong. That's where you're wrong because the most sincere worship that will ever come off your lips is when nobody else is around to hear it but God. Do you ever pray when you're by yourself? When nobody else is around to listen? No, I pray in church. That's what church is for. No, wrong, wrong, wrong. You see, that's why you're missing out on so many things. That's why you're missing out on the good stuff that God wants to give you because you're not taking advantage of the intimacy that God is trying to draw you into. Well, if I'm in church and God happens to throw the Holy Ghost at me and I start talking in tongues, then so be it. Um... Why don't you worship the Lord a little bit when you're all by yourself somewhere and see if God don't fill you with the Holy Ghost while you're worshiping Him all by your lonesome somewhere? My Lord, have mercy. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, I want to tell you today, folks. I want to tell you. God wants to draw us into a place of intimacy. Many people can pray. They can shout. They can cry. When they have others around to see and hear them. I've got an aunt. God forgive me. I've got an aunt. Boy, I mean to tell you, she can shout. 
She, well, she can put on a woo, 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 woo. She can shout all over the church. Oh, she can cry the biggest crocodile tears you ever laid eyes in your life on. Long as there's somebody there to see them. <clears throat> Long as there's somebody around to see them. She can cry the biggest tears. She can shout the loudest shout. She can pray the longest prayers. Long as there's somebody around to see them. See, now I'm going to tell you a little secret. How do you know somebody has an intimate walk with God? How do you know somebody has a prayer life when nobody's looking? Because if you're not there to see it, how do you know they pray in secret? How do you know they give alms in secret? How do you know they give to the poor and they help people when nobody else is looking? And by the way, for the record, this passage talks about motivation, not method. A lot of people love to point to this passage. You see, I'm a pastor, and there are times I'll point out on Facebook and stuff about how I tried to help somebody or try, how I tried to do something for somebody. I know what I'm doing, folks, so trust me, I'm not just a, you know, I'm not trying to draw attention to myself. It's not about attention. I'm trying to set an example. If you don't know I ever do it, then what kind of example am I? I'm not, because you never, you're not seeing it. Doesn't have to do, Johnny. God's not saying that you can't be seen doing something. He said when you give alms. Well, in biblical times when you gave alms, that literally meant when you would, when you would give something to the poor. Well, most of the time... That would be a street beggar, or that would be somebody on the street, or somebody on the sidewalk. So obviously when you give to them, people are going to see you give. Right. But what the Lord said is, when you give your alms, listen, take heed that ye do not your alms before men. So what does that mean? If I'm going to give to the poor, i got to drag them around the corner into an alley where nobody's looking? No, that's not what he's saying. Listen, he continues, comma, to be seen of them. So it has to do with motivation, not method. It's not about whether you give your alms in front of others, it's about whether you're doing it in front of others to be seen of others. Am I sharing this stuff online? Because I want people to tell me how wonderful I am, and I want people to worship me, and I want people to think, oh, Pastor Charles is the greatest guy in the universe. No. I'm doing it because Christians need to understand Paul said in some of his writings, ye know my example. Am I telling the truth? He said, you know how I do things. Do things the way you've seen me do them. He said, I've set an example for you. Jesus even said, I've set an example for you. Well, you can't set an example by doing stuff in secret. Hello now. No, I'm trying to help I, if I could get every Christian that follows me on Facebook to do things the way I'm trying to do them, and if I could get them to follow the example, honey, I think we'd have a better world, wouldn't we? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I'm not doing those things to be seen. So it's not about doing these things in secret. It's about why you're doing these things. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? But I want to tell you something. If you do these things in intimacy, if you have an intimate prayer life, if you have an intimate worship life, if you do things charitable, godly, compassionate things when nobody else is looking, I'm going to tell you a secret. Here's what Jesus said. He said, God will reward you openly. Isn't that what we just read? He said, if you pray in secret, he said, your Father will reward you openly. If you give alms when nobody else is looking, if you do it without the intent of others, you know, seeing you, without the intent of others thinking you're Mr. Wonderful. 
said, God will reward you openly. You know how you can tell that somebody is a prayer, that somebody knows how to pray, that somebody has a prayer life, even though you may never one time see them on their knees praying? You know how you tell? Because you'll see the blessing of God on their life in open. Hello now. You will see God blessing them and helping them in open. Or I'm going to tell you, I've known some godly, wonderful Christian people. I didn't have to see them down on their knees praying every day to know that they knew how to pray when nobody was looking. You know why? Because, Bill, their life was blessed. The blessing of God was on their life. Why? Because God was rewarding them openly. Are you hearing what I'm telling you now? For that which they do in secret. I'm going to tell you, people in the church who are constantly struggling and constantly having a difficult time and constantly going through all these things. And we've had some people in this church who every time you turned around, they were griping about something else. They were constantly struggling financially. They were constantly struggling. Couldn't make car payments. Couldn't make insurance payments. Couldn't do this. Couldn't do that. Couldn't do this. Couldn't do that. I got a little secret for you. I can tell you why. Because that's the kind of person that talks a good game but don't know how to walk what they talk. Oh, boy, I told you if I lose what few people we got, oh, well, I'm moving to Florida. No. I'm going to tell you something, folks. It's the truth today. Every day, I've been pastoring a long time. I can see through people sometimes like tissue paper, okay? <clears throat> we get these people come to church and bless God. They're just as spiritual. They put on the air of being the most spiritual person in the church. Why, in church... <coughs> they can worship like there's no tomorrow. Why in church they can pray like nobody's ever prayed. In front of an audience they can give and do things for people like you ain't never seen. But I can tell you, having been a pastor for over 35 years, I can tell you, they don't have much of a prayer life when nobody's looking. They don't have much of a worship life when nobody's looking. They don't have much compassion and much generosity of spirit and much in the way of charity when nobody's looking. You know how I know? Because God is not rewarding them openly. Am I telling the truth today? Yep. Yep. Say, Lord, I don't understand why you're not doing more things for me. And the Lord says, because you're not taking time to be with me intimately. The sweetest kisses are those which are offered in secret. See, you kiss me on the face when everybody in town is standing around watching you. But when we're in private and there ain't nobody around, you don't even talk to me. When we're in private and nobody's around, you'd rather listen to Mariah Carey than listen to gospel. Oh my goodness. Tommy says, oh, I'm off the hook because I don't listen to Mariah Carey. Okay, Beyonce. I'm going to nail you. I'm going to get it, booby. He thinks he's going to get off the hook. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Are you taking the opportunity? Are you taking the time to be intimate with God? That is what this message is about today. Are you taking advantage of opportunities to find intimacy with the Lord? The Word of God says that God gives us songs in the night. Sometimes, Sister Gillum said, many years ago that that was one of her favorite songs in the world. A song that we sang in the Church of God called Songs in the Night. Songs in the Night. Songs in the Night when I meet them. My God giveth songs in the night. She said, I love that because how many times I'm laying alone on the bed and I'm going through something and God puts a song in my heart. And I just begin to sing that song.
And I just begin to worship him. And oh, all of a sudden, my trouble melts away. All of a sudden, that struggle that I'm going through just diminishes and dissipates until I forget all about it because God gave me a song in the night. You see, it's in that intimate time. It's in that alone time with God. Oh, you want to see God start doing more things for you in your life openly? Start doing more things with Him privately. I hope you heard me. Do you want to see God doing more things for you openly? Start doing more things with Him. I didn't say for Him. With Him privately. Nobody's around. It's a quiet time. Maybe you're cutting down a tree in the backyard. Nobody's around. You got that old noisy chainsaw going. But you know, sometimes a noisy chainsaw is a wonderful cover because it helps to drown out any distractions. You don't hear nothing but that old loud chainsaw. So you know what? Talk to the Lord. You're, you're not distracted. You ain't got nobody else around yakking at you. So talk to the Lord. You're by yourself. You're driving your car. Talk to the Lord. Sing. Sing praises. Worship Him. I'm going to tell you, I probably look like a nut driving in my car down the street half the time. Because that's when I have church. I have better church in my car by myself than I do here in church half the time. I'll be out on a long stretch of road between here and Oklahoma. No other cars around, nothing around, just beautiful mountains and trees and open meadows and fields that have been hayed, you know. Those big old round bales of hay laying out in the field. Cows out in the pastures. And that's all I can see. There's not a human being for miles. And there I am, shouting like I'm having church. There I am, praying in the Holy Ghost. There I am, praying. There I am, crying and weeping before the Lord. I must look like some kind of... No, I don't, because ain't nobody else around to see you. No way. I look just fine. But see, God knows in those private times that I'm sincere. Because there's nobody else around. Some Christians have a difficult time approaching the Lord in prayer or giving or worshiping unless they have others in the room. But God desires to draw us into intimacy so that we feel most comfortable sharing our hearts, offering our praise, or doing a good deed without the intention of being seen. I've got family members that I've witnessed over the decades who could weep buckets of crocodile tears while sitting in church. Oh, because in church when old sister so-and-so was sitting there, everybody's coming over. Oh, sister, oh, are you okay? Can I pray with you? Oh, Lord! But when you're alone with God, do you pour your heart out that way? When you're alone with the Lord, do you let the tears flow? When you're alone with God, I, I'll be alone in the car listening to some gospel music or listening to some preaching. And something that I hear will touch my heart and Johnny tears just begin to flow. There's no motivation. There's nothing going on. Nobody's around to see me. Not even Tommy's there to see me. Does it happen sometimes when Tommy's in the car? Yeah. Absolutely it does. But you know what? The sincerest kisses, the sweetest kisses are those which are done in secret. Those are the ones that are done when nobody's there to see. Nobody's there to hear. I've heard some believers boast of the prayer life of a saint in the church who every day could be observed praying for hours on end in the church house. Oh, really? Jesus said in 
verse number 5 of our primary text today. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets. Oh, they love to be. They love to pray in the synagogues. You know why? Because everybody that comes in and out of the synagogue sees them praying. Oh, sister, so-and-so, bless God, she got the best prayer life. We had one fellow in this church who bragged all the time about one lady he knew from an old church he used to belong to. Oh, I'll tell you what, she was, oh, she was the most spiritual person I ever knew. Hallelujah. Every time you went to the church, you'd find her praying. Really? And every time he'd say that to me, I, the thought went through my head. Really? Because that's not what the Bible tells us to do. The Bible tells us go into our prayer closet, am I telling the truth, mm -hmm. and it says shut the door. Mm -hmm. See, she wasn't praying in a prayer closet with the door shut. No, she was praying where she knew people could come in and find her praying. She knew that people were seeing her praying. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Now, am I saying that that was her motivation? No, I'm not saying she was motivated by people seeing her. But I'm saying that whether she was motivated by that or not, that was the byproduct of her praying in the synagogue or in the church. Do you follow what I mean? There's not true intimacy. There's not true privacy when you're praying in a place where you could be interrupted at any moment or you could be observed at any moment. No, real intimacy, real privacy is when you are totally cut off from all distractions. Nobody's going to walk in on me in my prayer closet. You'd have to make up your mind you were going to do so if you were going to come. What of the saints that don't make their prayer life a matter of observation? My little brother come to me years ago. I'm almost done today. My little brother come to me years ago. He used to go spend time with friends of his in the church. And the mother of this family, they had a bunch of kids in Dallas. My brother, he used to hang out with these kids. And the mother was a real demure, quiet lady, you know. She'd come to church. And I told you, not everybody in a Pentecostal church has to shout and run the aisles and dance and all that. It's all right for you to be a more quiet person. There ain't nothing wrong with that. And Sister Washington, bless her heart, she was just the quietest little church mouse you ever saw. She'd sit there, and I mean, people be shouting and dancing and running the aisles, and she'd just be sitting there quiet as a church mouse. And my little brother Dallas came to me one day. He said, you know how quiet and demure Sister Washington is in church and all? I said, yeah. He said, holy smokes, you ought to hear her praying when she's home. He said, we kids will be out in the yard playing, you know. And he said, she done went in her bedroom, closed the door, locked it, and she's praying in her bedroom. He said, man, you can hear her shout and scream and holler and cry all the way out in the yard. He said, she just pouring her heart out to God. You can hear her all over the place. See, she had an intimate life with God. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? She was intimate with God. Oh, she took advantage of every opportunity to experience intimacy with God, even though in the public arena she wasn't very demonstrative. I'm going to tell you a little secret about Sister Washington, and I can say this honestly. One of the sweetest, kindest, most generous of heart Christian ladies that I've ever known in my life. And when I needed somebody to help me with my little brother many years ago, the Washington, she and her husband stepped up and they did a, a marvelous thing for me in helping to take care of my brother. You see, I'm going to tell you something. God rewarded that lady openly for what she did in secret. God rewarded that family openly, that husband and wife openly for what they did in secret. A parent who prays in the view of their children is no doubt setting an example for their children. But it also 
is possible that the whole purpose of their visible prayer is just to do that. They could be praying in front of their kids, Bill, specifically to set an example for their kids. But I got news for you. If you're praying to set an example for your kids, then you're not praying for the reason you ought to be praying. Are you following what I'm saying today? Sincerity is born uh, in intimacy. The more intimate, the more sincere. Everyone has heard the adage, the truest measure of a man is not that which he does in public, but rather that which he does in private or in secret. This is the truth which the Lord himself alludes to in the sixth chapter of Matthew. I've shouted more in the privacy of my own home than I've ever shouted in church. I'll tell you right now. I've shouted more in privacy when there wasn't another human being around than I've ever shouted in front of Tommy. I've prayed most often when no one is looking. I've shed tears and prayed earnestly and fervently when only the Lord was hearing my words or seeing my tears. Human beings are funny creatures. Motivations can come from the strangest places. It is not at all hard to understand that public acts can often have motivations that are less than pure. Like I was talking about at the beginning of this message. The rewards of a life that is anchored in prayer, praise, and charity are open and visible. We ought to be able to look at a believer's life and say, they must surely pray and worship and do the works of God. For look at the blessings in their life. You ought to be able to know they pray. You ought to be able to know they worship. You ought to be able to know they do things when nobody's around to look. Because you ought to be able to see the blessings of God in their life. Because he said, if you do these things in secret, I will reward you openly. We ought not to see the act, but we should see the fruit or the rewards that are openly yielded by those secret acts. Corporate prayer is valuable, even essential, but it cannot be a substitute for a private, secret prayer life. Corporate worship cannot be the full sum of our praise and our worship life. Public acts of charity and kindness are impossible to avoid. You cannot avoid, you know, occasionally doing something that people are going to see. But it's not the act, but rather the act's intention that determines whether it's worthy of an open reward from our Heavenly Father. Matthew 14, 22 through 23, trying to close up and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side. While he sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, listen, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. He set an example for us folks of intimate prayer life. He set an example for us to follow of finding time to be alone with God. He had just spent the whole day around a bunch of people and he sent the disciples. He didn't even want the disciples to stay with him. He sent them on ahead and sent the, the, the uh, multitudes away and then he went up in the mountain so he could be alone and pray. Mark chapter 14 verses 32 through 37 and and they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, Listen, the Lord's heavy hearted. He's really struggling right now. He took his disciples to the garden to pray. Then he said, James, John, Peter, you guys come with me. He went a little further up. He's feeling heavy hearted. He said, 
So, like most Pentecostals, he said, y'all gather around me and help me pray. Hallelujah. Glory to God. No. Listen. And he saith unto them, to Peter, James, and John, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. In other words, stay right here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed. Oh, I'm going to tell you, sometimes the best thing you can do is get along with God. Sometimes the best thing you can do, you don't need to help, you don't need people to get around you and help you pray. You need to learn how to get along and pray. Jesus said things are really getting heavy because he knew he was about to be arrested. He knew he was about to be scorched and beaten. He knew he was about to stand in Pilate's court. He knew he was about to be crucified. He knew he was about to die. He said, my heart is exceedingly heavy. Y'all stay here a minute. And he went up even further so he could find. I'm going to tell you, when we have prayer meeting in church, this pastor don't get in the middle of everybody else that's praying. Never happened. And I don't care if you notice it when it happens or not. We have prayer meeting in church. I'm going to find the most secret place I can find out of the whole sanctuary. I'm going to go off to a corner somewhere where I can be alone with God. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? The church house may be full of 50 or 60 people. That's okay. But I'm still going to find the most intimate place I can find. I don't mind praying with other people, but I don't want other people hearing me. I don't want other people watching me. That's not why I'm there. Acts chapter 10, verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, listen, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray. Peter understood there are times you just need to get along with God. There are times you just need to have intimacy with the Lord. Whenever the Lord has wanted to do great things and he needed someone through whom to do them, he would always lure them away to a secluded place. Remember the story of Moses? He was lured up to the top of Mount Sinai by a burning bush. <laughs> he saw a fire, but he couldn't understand why it wasn't spreading. So he had to go check it out, and that was just God's way of getting his attention. Moses, I need you to get up here away from everybody else. I need you to get up here away from everything else. I need you to get up here where there are no other distractions so that you and I can talk intimately. I've got big plans for you. I've got big plans. I've got things I want to do, and I want to use you to do them. But I'm not just going to come down there into the valley and and talk to you with a booming loud voice. No, I'm going to pull you away to an intimate place so we can talk. Why? Simple. Because the sincerest kisses, the sweetest kisses, are those which are offered in secret. Am I telling the truth today?